Today's lecturer is Matt Hall. Matthew Hall is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science. Uh, he did his PhD at Yale, where he received it with distinction, uh, and then went to St. Louis University before coming on to Notre Dame uh, in, two in 2013. His book, The Nature of Supreme Court Power, was published by Cambridge University Press, which is unquestionably, and I say that not just as somebody who is a, studied at the University of Cambridge and taught there, uh, Cambridge University Press is the outstanding press for work in political science. And the book won a number of awards, including the Alpha Sigma Nu Award for Outstanding Publishing Achievement in the Humanities and Social Sciences, presented by the Honor Society of Jesuit Institutions of Higher Education in 2013. He's published a number of articles in all the leading journals in political science and in various book collections. And his current work, which is exactly what he's going to be talking about, tries to look at personality and how we might judge personality and what effect that has on judicial behavior. There's one way in which this, uh, today's talk is particularly timely in a way that uh, we didn't anticipate when we set the program, and that is that on Monday, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg will be on campus uh, in conversation at 5.30. Uh, I think there are tickets still, some tickets still available. It's in the Joyce uh, Stadium. Uh, so if you want to go, check on the website, you don't get many chances to listen to Supreme Court justices unless you happen to be at Notre Dame, where they seem to come rather often. In the meantime, until Monday, as it were, Matt Hall. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, joining me uh, before your football game day. Uh, I hope you'll forgive my casual wardrobe. They said you can go suit and tie, you can go football outfit. I decided on this, and as I was getting ready this morning, my wife said, are you sure you don't want to wear a suit and tie? There's going to be alums there. I really don't think they'll take you seriously if you're dressed for a football game. I said, this is Notre Dame. They're not going to take me seriously if I'm not dressed for the football game. So uh, I opted for this. Today I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on uh, for about two years. Uh, coincidentally, around the time I married a personality psychologist, I became really interested in personality psychology. And uh, being a scholar of the Supreme Court, I decided uh, I, uh, I should look at how Supreme Court justices' personality might influence their uh, behavior, which coincidentally was a convenient excuse to make this collage. Uh, some people assume I started with the collage and then backed into a, a project that I could justify putting it up. But uh, that's what motivated me to look at this. And this project fits into a broader literature that uh, is in political science in which we as social scientists try to understand why Supreme Court justices make the choices that they make, right? Supreme Court justices make a thousand different decisions uh, every term, and we want to understand why do different justices make different choices. And this literature has a long history going back to the 60s and 70s when we primarily followed social psychological models. And social psychological models uh, look at the justice's behavior by thinking of them in a simple stimulus response model. So you have a case, and the judge hears the case, and judges spit out a response. The judge hears a case, spits out a, a vote. And different judges spit out different responses because of individual differences between the judges. Right? So it's the characteristics of the judge that determine what sort of response you get. And early studies looked at demographic characteristics, race, age, sex, uh, but then more advanced studies started to look at professional background, training, and individual characteristics such as role orientations and even personality traits. But this literature died in the late 70s, and it was overtaken, as so many things often are, by the economics literature. The economics literature, when it moved into political science, encouraged us to think of individual decision makers in terms of a rational choice model. So now, a judge isn't a black box that spits out an answer when it hears a case. A judge is a rational human being who is weighing the costs and benefits of different choices in an effort to maximize the judge's individual utility. And 
Th those judges are operating in a strategic context with other judges, and those other judges have the same utility function going on in their head. They're all trying to maximize their own utility. And so economic models will write utility functions that look something like this. Judges want utility, just goodness, things the judge wants. And we can try to break up what kind of things does a judge care about. Maybe they care about policy influence, prestige, collegiality, leisure time. The problem with these models is that they generally assume that all judges are the same. So whereas we went from being really, really interested in who the judge is, because we think that's going to determine everything, these models focus solely on what judges in general want without looking at, well, maybe different judges want different things. And so I'm posing what I call a psychoeconomic approach, mainly because I like that word. And in the psychoeconomic approach, the judge is a rational actor, right? Here in the case, trying to maximize his own utility. But different judges have slightly different utility functions. That is, the different judges want different things. And so some judges might care a lot about one thing, not so much about a second. The, uh, the second judge cares a lot about that second thing, not so much about the first. The trick is, how are we going to measure what different justices want? And this is where the personality literature comes in, because there's an extensive uh, body of research in the psychology discipline looking at individual personality traits. And those personality traits describe, among other things, people's motivational tendencies, what people ten how people tend to behave and what they want. Uh, the, mo the premier model of personality in the psychology literature is the five-factor model, also called the big five. All right? These are five, they call them factors, you can think of them as traits, that broadly describe a person's global personality. In other words, these five traits are going to generally, in broad strokes, describe what an individual wants and how they behave. Uh, the big five are conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, and openness. All right, these are the big five personality traits. Um, if you rearrange them, you can remember them with the acronym OCEAN. Uh, but they are not immediately apparent, uh, so I want to walk through quickly what these involve. Conscientiousness involves uh, characteristics like dutifulness, uh, someone being organized, dependable, self-disciplined, efficient. Extroverts are outgoing, talkative, sociable. Agreeableness is a uh, tendency to be affable, kind, tolerant. Neuroticism is uh, anxiety, moodiness, uh, general tendency to negative emotions. And openness is uh, an intellectualism, creative, curious. A big problem when you introduce the big five to someone is that they immediately put a valence these characteristics, right? Some of them seem like things you want to be, and some of them thing, seem like things you don't want to be, right? No one's real thrilled to volunteer that they're highly neurotic, right? And everyone would love to say, I'm open, okay? But what I want to encourage you to think about is these are a spectrum, and when you go too high or too low on any of the spectrums, there's going to be a problem, right? So in order to illustrate that real quickly, uh, I think about openness. An open person is very curious about new things, interested in change and variety. And so people who are really high on openness love to go to museums. They love to read books. They love to do new things. That all sounds great. They're also much more likely to get divorced because they're curious and they want to try. They like change and variety and they like different things, right? So. You can, there are downsides to things that initially might sound uh, positive, and there are upsides to things that might sound negative. So for instance, when people are extremely low on neuroticism, they basically have an absence of emotionality. They are indifferent, they're cold, they're uh, unsympathetic. And so that lack of passion can be a big negative. In fact, being high on neuroticism is a really good predictor of career success. Because when you're anxious about doing, doing well at your job, you tend to do better at your job. Um, and so 
Obviously, being too high on neuroticism can be bad, but being too low can also be bad. And that's true, really, uh, with all of these characteristics. Now, what we want to do is we want to think about, okay, how could we take these basic characteristics and fit them into a model of what judges want? And so, drawing on psychology literature, I break these uh, characteristics down into thinking of them as a preference for something you want as an individual. So the more conscientious you are, the more you care about duty. The more extroverted you are, the more you care about social interaction. Agreeableness means you care about social harmony. So social interaction and social harmony seem similar. Think of it as how, how much do you like being around other people and how much do you like getting along with other people? We probably all know someone who is very talkative and loves to interact but doesn't mind getting into a fight or an argument. That's very different than social harmony the desire to get along with other people. Neuroticism, I categorize as loss aversion. That's a term from economics. Think of it as um, when something bad happens, how much weight do you put on that? How much are you worried about something bad happening in your life? And how eager are you to avoid it? A classic example of loss aversion is risk aversion. So if I were to say, uh, do you want $5 or do you want a 50% chance at $10? The expected value is the exact same, right? But people who are loss averse like to avoid risk because they don't want to end up with nothing. So they'll take the $5 right now. If you're not loss averse, not risk averse, you'll take the gamble. Let's shoot for 10. Uh, and then finally, openness is an interest in intellectual stimulation. You like different things. You like change, variety. Um, so I build a model with this in which the utility function are these five things judges want, but they're moderated by the personality traits. In other words, going back to the beginning of what I'm trying to do, we can think about judges want these things. So judges like social harmony. They would like to get along with the other members of the court because that makes their lives better. But some judges care more about getting along with other members of the court than other judges, right? For some judges, this is really important to get along with my coworkers. For other judges, no, I don't care about getting along with my coworkers. I don't put a lot of value on that. And so we can measure how much value they put on these goals by looking at their traits. Highly agreeable judges should care more about getting along with their other judges. And we should be able to predict their behavior if we can measure their personality traits. Which brings us to the question of how do we measure these personality traits? Traditionally, the psychology literature measures personality through surveys. As you can imagine, it's not easy to get Supreme Court justices to fill out surveys, <laughs> particularly the ones who are no longer alive. Um, and even if they did, I'm not sure we would trust it, right, for exactly the reasons I said before. If you are an anxious person, you probably don't want to broadcast that when you're in the public uh, spotlight. And so even if I could get the judges to fill out the survey, I'm not sure we'd trust their responses. And so this isn't going to work. So <coughs> instead, I adopt a strategy of measuring personality traits through language use. So the gut instinct here is that psychologists have discovered that people with certain traits tend to use different words. In other words, imagine you spoke to another person. Imagine you and your spouse had a conversation. And afterwards, you could describe that conversation as we had a conversation, we had a discussion, uh, we had an argument, or we had a fight. All of those words might be accurate descriptions of what happened. But people with certain traits tend to use different words. More disagreeable people will pull out, we had a fight, much more quickly than agreeable people. And so when we look at your language pattern, we can estimate your personality traits based on what words you tend to use. Does that make sense? So we can look at the words the justices use when writing their opinions to try to estimate their personality traits. Now, there's a few immediate problems with this. The first one is majority opinions are actually a collaborative effort. Lots of judges fight to get language into the majority opinion. They compromise. Those aren't going to be helpful. We could throw together all of their concurring and dissenting opinions, 
But that would be a problem because we could expect that when justices dissent, they use more disagreeable language, for example, than when they are concurring, that is, agreeing with the majority, but they want to say something a little different. And so if I were to just throw them together, we might, we might be biasing our estimates based on their behavior. We don't want to do that. So we're just going to look at their concurrences. We're going to put them into a uh, sophisticated program that the psychologists and the computer scientists have put together for us called the personality recognizer. And we're going to generate scores for these judges on each of these five factors. So we have the scores. What do we want to do with them? We want to see if those scores help us predict the way judges behave. So before I get into predicting, I'm going to show you some of the scores. Uh, to, to give you an idea of what we learn from this estimation strategy. So we'll just look at a couple traits. For instance, on extroversion, uh, oh, and we generate different traits for every year that they're on the court. So we, that we can get a little variation over time, but there isn't much. So for instance, Justice Sotomayor uh, is the most extroverted justice that's ever been on the court. Uh, this fits nicely with how she's been described in, for example, popular press. Uh, articles. Justice Scalia is a fairly extroverted justice. Way down here at the bottom, Justice Burton, uh, I'm sure famous to all of you, a very, very introverted justice. Uh, looking at agreeableness, Justice O'Connor is the highest in agreeableness. Justice Roberts is actually the lowest in agreeableness uh, in this data. I was a little surprised about that. Justice Kennedy is just sort of in the middle, but I'd give you that for reference. Uh, and then lastly, I, I won't go through all of them, but for conscientiousness, uh, in an older court era, Justice Harlan, actually the most conscientious. Scalia is a close second. And lowest in conscientiousness, uh, Alito, and um, that name Roberts is not correct. That is a different justice, and I'm forgetting who it's supposed to be right now, but those years are definitely wrong. Uh, that's Justice White, I'm pretty sure. That's White and Alito just based on the year. Okay, so do the judges make different decisions depending on their different personality traits? So this is a part of a large book project in which I'm gonna look at all kinds of different Supreme Court behavior from uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is when they decide to hear a case, the agenda setting process, all the way through assigning the majority opinion, uh, how do they behave in conference? How do they vote on the merits of the case? Do they decide to write their own opinion? Do they join other justices' opinions? I'm going to look at all sorts of different behavior. I'm going to start today with agenda setting, because it's the first thing judges do in a case. For those of you who aren't familiar with the agenda setting process, every year the court gets about 100,000 petitions for certiorari. This is basically a petition asking the court to hear a case. They're going to end up hearing only about 80 of those cases. All right, so this is a really, really important process, how we get down to these 80 cases. First, the clerks go through the uh, cases, and they suggest cases to go on the discuss list. And any individual justice can add a case to the discuss list. So once a case, and this list is far, far smaller. Once a, list gets on the discuss, uh, once a case gets on the discuss list, then the justices meet and vote on whether or not to hear the case. And they use what's called the rule of four, meaning you don't need a majority to hear a case. You only need four of the nine justices to agree to hear a case. And so I'm going to look at, uh, whoops, I'm going to look at why, I'm going to look at uh, how the justice's personality influences their certiorari voting. That is. Do justices with certain traits uh, tend to be more likely or less likely to agree to hear cases? Um, now, the literature has whoops. The literature has found that some things we already know about certiorari. For instance, a real good rule is that when there's a conflict between the circuits, that is, when the Ninth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit disagree, then the federal law is literally different in different parts of the country for a while. Justices are much more likely to hear that case so that they can resolve the conflict. Not 100%, but they're much more likely. So that's something we already know. We know they tend to agree uh, that, in general, they're looking at the same case. They all have similar training. Justices tend to agree with one another on whether or not a case merits cert. Um, so I'm going to look today at uh, my data is a little bit limited. I can't 
look at all of the justices because cert votes, we have to rely on the papers, the private papers of the justices after they die. They'll release their notes sometimes. And Justice Blackman kept excellent records of who was voting uh, in cert and how they voted. And so people have gone through the Blackman papers and figured out the cert votes. So that's the only way we know, because otherwise cert votes are always secret. So uh, how does personality affect how you tend to vote? Um, so and it, because I don't have all the justices, I'm showing you the full range of all of my justices. Some of these graphs are going to be truncated because we don't have justices in the full range in that time period, just to warn you. So how does personality affect cert votes? Well, first, let's look at openness. Remember, this is a desire for intellectual stimulation. As you could imagine, hearing more cases means more interesting arguments, more reading briefs, more talking uh, about ideas. And so we'd expect more open justices to vote to grant cert more often. And that's, whoops, that's exactly what we see. Uh, the least open justice in my sample uh, votes yes on a case in the, in the uh, discussed list less than 10% of the time. The most open in this sample, which is about the middle of my entire sample, more than 20%. In other words, how open the justice is will double the odds of that justice voting in favor of granting cert. Now, neurotis, uh, neurotic justices should be worried about negative consequences. And every time you hear a case, there's a possibility for negative consequences. Maybe you're going to issue a ruling that embarrasses the court and is criticized by law professors and it's in the media and there are protests outside the court. Maybe you're going to go down in history for saying something uh, dumb in, a, in an opinion that later is looked at badly. Maybe the decision is going to be overruled in the future and it's an embarrassment to the court. All sorts of bad things can happen when you hear a case. If you just don't hear a case, you, by default, 99.9% .9 of the time, no way to embarrass yourself that way. So highly neurotic justices should want to hear fewer cases. And that's exactly what we see. We go from an odds of about 35% to about 3% for the most neurotic justice of, of voting to grant cert. Conscientious justices um, actually become le are less likely to grant cert. And this is something where actually it could have gone either way. Hearing more cases might mean more work. So you might think conscientious justices are more likely. But conscientious, justices like to, ju conscientious people like to be careful and precise. So the more cases you hear, the less time you can spend on each one. That's one of the reasons why I think uh, this is a negative slope. A uh, bigger thing, I think, is that conscientious justices are more interested in fulfilling their duty. Their legal obligations. That's a big part of conscientiousness is dutifulness. And a, a judge's duty, of course, is to resolve legal questions, not to influence policy. But the best way, but a lot of judges want to influence policy. And the best way to influence policy is to hear more cases, because you affect more, uh, you affect more outcomes. And so I think that's a big part driving this. But I don't want to focus on that so much as on uh, how conscientiousness interacts with conflict. I said before that one of the very consistent findings in this literature is that judges are more likely to hear a case when there's a conflict between the circuits. Okay? Now, one of the good things about a conflict case is that it's really obvious that this might be a good case to grant certain. The, in fact, when the law clerks go through it, the law clerks independently evaluate, is this really a case of conflict, regardless of what the um, lawyers are claiming? Is there really a conflict here? And they basically put a big flag on it. This is a conflict case, right? It's very easy to see. You don't have to spend a lot of time. You don't have to spend a lot of energy. You don't have to dig into this case. It's broadcast. And so justices who are low in conscientiousness, the lazy justices, that's a really easy signal. Oh, conflict, I vote yes. No conflict, I vote no. That's like the laziest thing a Supreme Court justice could do. Highly conscientious justices might want to look deeper. Well, what kind of conflict is it? How important is it? How likely is it that the conflict will resolve itself? One of the circuits will change their mind. Um, is this the best time to address it? Do we want to hear more circuits 
uh, hear this type of case and let other circuits weigh in on the issue before we get into it, it takes a lot more time and energy. And so, in general, the effect of conflict should be positive, right? Conflict should make you more likely for justices to hear cases. But that effect should be much stronger for the lazy justices. And so up here, I have the probability when there is and isn't conflict. That dashed line is when there's conflict. And as we expect, the dashed line is higher than the solid line. Justices are more likely to grant cert when there's conflict. But notice that as justices get more conscientious, that difference essentially goes away. Here at the bottom, I've plotted the difference between them. In other words, it's only the justices who are low in conscientiousness that are relying on this easy conflict signal. The highly conscientious justices, they don't like to hear a lot of cases in general, and conflict doesn't affect them. A similar dynamic happens with agreeableness. I told you before, justices tend to agree with each other, and that's not a surprise. Another justice wants to grant cert, I'm more likely to grant cert. But this effect is much stronger for more agreeable justices. In other words, if you're a highly agreeable justice, you're a lot more likely to go along with the others than if you're low in agreeableness. So this has just been like a quick snapshot of some of the things that we can predict with measuring these personality traits. But the broader idea here is that A, judges are humans, and so they have personalities like everyone else, and, we can, and those personalities affect their behavior. B, we can measure their personalities even without getting them to fill out a survey. And C, those measures of personality give us a really, really good leverage in predicting their behavior. Today, I told you about agenda setting, but the same patterns uh, play out in all sorts of different kinds of personality. I'm sorry, in all sorts of kinds of uh, judicial behavior. So moving forward, I'm hoping to work with other colleagues. I have some colleagues right here at Notre Dame studying this effect in Congress. Short version, everything I just described, congressmen do it too. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to expand into uh, other areas of potential research. So thank you so much. Uh, I think we're going to take some questions uh, for five or ten minutes maybe, if, if there are questions. In the back, sir. Yeah. Uh, given your study as far as the quality of justices, could someone use your research uh, if they were filing a petition for cert to structure the petition in such a way to basically, in effect, uh, track certain justices by virtue of how they approach uh, their petition? Absolutely. I haven't gotten to that stage but I could definitely envision a scenario in which, all right, I'm a lawyer writing a cert petition, and I know these two or three justices for maybe ideological reasons, they definitely are gonna wanna grant cert. So the question is, how am I gonna get to four, right? And I could definitely imagine, all right, we're gonna be targeting this specific justice, and that's the swing vote in our minds. And so if that's the swing vote, we want to craft the brief in such a way that appeals to that specific justice. And so, just off the top of my head, if you're trying to appeal to, um, for instance, a highly neurotic justice, I would try to emphasize the potential negatives of not granting cert. What bad things might happen if you don't grant cert in my case? Um, for in, if, in contrast, if you're trying to appeal to a highly agreeable justice, I try to use more agreeable language uh, to appeal. I haven't gotten to that stage of operationalizing uh, how this could be used in a practical way, but I definitely think that's uh, an avenue where this is headed. Uh, down here, sir. To what extent do you think the work activity and influence of clerks may have on that? It's a fantastic question, and it's one we struggled a lot with in the measurement process, right? Because clerks help. Um, craft the opinions. And so that's something that we were very concerned about. Um, it, as a measurement problem, one of the things we were, uh, one of the things we did to alleviate it was uh, excluding the majority opinions. Because whatever role justices play in writing their own opinions, 
we generally think they do more of that when they're writing a concurrence or dissent. Clerks always do the first draft of a, of a majority opinion. Still, there's potential for influence, though. And so uh, the, basically, the comforting aspect of this from a measurement process, from a measurement perspective, is that clerks are only on the court for a year. And so it, because we're measuring it across time, and there's very little variation in the personality measures across time, the only way that the, we could be capturing the clerk's personality instead of the justices is if the justices are systematically appointing clerks with the same personalities, which is still possible, right? It's possible Justice uh, Sotomayor just always appoints really extroverted clerks, and so we get extroverted opinions. But I'm actually not that concerned about it because what I'm concerned about is the work material that the justice produces. And if the justice always appoints extroverted clerks, and therefore the product of that justice's office is extroverted, I don't really care if it's the clerks. Or, you know, I'm not trying to predict Sotomayor's extroversion at a party. Uh, I'm trying to predict her extroversion in the court, so I'm, I'm less concerned about it. But I definitely think clerks could play a role, and trying to capture those differences is, is difficult and uh, interesting. Um, William? would you uh, give the balance between political affiliation or liberal conservativeness and personality? Oh. The best measures I have are that um, somewhere, so ideo ideology is uh, an unbelievably powerful predictor of Supreme Court behavior, okay? Um, and so it's a tough bar to meet. I would say that personality effects usually, uh, depending on what specific dependent variable you're looking at, um, somewhere in the range of a third to two thirds as big of an effect. So it's, it's not as big as ideology. Nothing is as big as ideology in predicting how Supreme Court justices behave. But somewhere in that range. The good thing is, depending on um, what type of behavior you're interested in, personality might actually be more helpful. So for instance, if you want to predict how often do you write your own opinion versus just join someone else's. Ideology doesn't actually help that much unless you're a real outlier. So Justice Thomas writes lots of opinions because Justice Thomas has um, uh, legal beliefs that no one else uh, even Scalia, like a lot of people don't understand that. Scalia and Thomas are radically divergent in their legal ideas, so Thomas writes separately a lot. But separating out someone like that, personality can be better at predicting how often you write an opinion because ideology shouldn't directly predict that uh, unless it's an unusual case like the Thomas case. Uh, in the back. Um, does your research look at the overall decline in the number of the grant of writs, and my understanding is it's about half of what it was a few decades ago. Yes, and I have not looked at that. One of the, you know, right now I'm looking at everything at an individual level. One of the things I'd like to do, and this is something that my uh, scholars looking at Congress are they're also doing, is think about how personality plays out in teams. So rather than think about, all right, how does this one person behave based on that one person's personality? How does a team operate? Uh, and how does the team affect outcomes? So for instance, maybe uh, the, for instance, the Burger Court wouldn't hear 80 cases a term. They'd hear 120 cases a term, maybe more. Uh, maybe it was a more open court on average. Maybe it was a more extroverted court. They like to argue with each other. I don't know. Um, but I haven't gotten there, but I think that's an interesting thing to look at court-level effects. It'll probably be better to look at Congress because we have more teams with all the committees um, and more variation. With the Supreme Court, right, I only have the nine and variation over time. But it's, it's yeah, it's an interesting way to go. Um, sir. If you had to pick an ideal Supreme Court justice personality, well, do you have an idea of what that would be? Well, it would depend on what you want, right? So, I mean, a perfect example, I, I didn't present it today, but I just said earlier that the strongest predictor of um, Supreme Court behavior, say like just the vote on the merits, who, which party do you vote for? 
is your ideology. What I neglected to mention is that part of what my book will uh, talk about when I get to it is that that effect, the ideology effect, is extremely powerful for justices who are low in conscientiousness and very, very small for conscientious judges. Conscientious judges are less ideological across the board. And so I can't answer the question until you tell me who you are and why you want to pick a judge. If you're a president trying to put a judge on the court who is going to fight for your ideological beliefs, I'd pick one low in conscientiousness. Because that, you know, if you're a liberal and you want a liberal judge who's going to make liberal decisions for the next 25 years, pick one that's low in conscientiousness. A highly conscientious liberal might run into situations where, oh, the law says I have to do the conservative thing, so I'm going to do it. You don't want that guy. Uh, but if you care about other things, I'd go another way. So, yeah, me, I'd like to see a judge uh, highly conscientious and uh, probably highly open. Um, but it, it depends who you are and what you want. Yes, sir? Obviously, personality is a big factor in it, but have you ever focused on using your characteristics on how a judge ended up perceiving the rule of law? And to just summarize, we sometimes say a textualist, right. a strict textualist, in other words, literal meaning or the meaning of the language, or a person who believes in a living constitution. Right. Sort of the, and, and focus on it, because that is, and I, uh, I'm very, I've actually, I actually have attended lectures and met three of the sitting members. Um, and I am a lawyer. Uh, so uh, I think that factor, that perception of what the rule of law is, determines to a great extent and makes it very predictable how they will rule. And it also, the more, if you had six liberal judges, they would be pumping out 150 opinions a year. And if you had six conservative judges, or more the traditional rule of law, they would be pumping out as many opinions a year as they could. And whether they were conscientious or not, that's what they would be doing. And that's the reason why we've seen a drop, is this court is so closely split. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we're 4-4. Um, and, and the risk aversion, the risk aversion when it's closed. Right, because it could go if you can't predict the other judge's votes. Yeah. Uh, so my, my short answer to that is that this isn't really my research. This is something that other scholars in political science have struggled with for decades, is we have extreme difficulty operationalizing the concepts you're talking about, I would describe as like legal philosophy, living constitutionalism, originalism, strict, con uh, strict textualism. We have a hard time operationalizing those concepts in such a way that is truly distinct from ideology. And so notice, even when you were talking about it, you started out talking about living constitution versus originalism, strict textualism. But by the end of your comment, you were talking about six liberals on the court versus six conservatives. And so the, the best answer I can give is that as political scientists, it is at best an open question as to whether or not legal philosophy is truly a separate variable that is driving behavior, or rather a label that judges place on themselves post hoc to justify their behavior. So the question is, is, is Scalia first an originalist, and then his originalism leads him to conservative outcomes? Or is he first a conservative, promotes conservative outcomes, but then doesn't want to sound political, and so says, no, I'm an originalist, to justify? And we as political scientists have incredible difficulty separating out those concepts. Now, I mean, anecdotally, you can point, right, Justice Black, a liberal textualist, versus Justice Scalia, a conser or, I'm sorry, Justice Thomas, a conservative textualist, right? So in theory, we could separate them, but it's so hard to measure who is really a textualist and who is not, uh, other than maybe if they self-label themselves, which many do not. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting question, but one that we have not been able to tackle from, from measurement difficulty. Other questions? I, 
I think we'll take one more and then maybe I'm uh, running out of time. So one more, ma'am. It seems that the uh, people who are opposing the promotion, the appointment of a, a judge for the vacancy are aware judge Garland. of this factor of personality. Oh, no, I don't think... Uh, I don't think they know and I don't think they care. I mean, it's, you know, the, the short version, that's a political process. I study judges, I don't study Congress. But I mean, you know, the, the short version is really not much more than you see on the news. It's, uh, it's a political fight and they couldn't care less. It's just a D or an R and they'll, they'll fight based on that, yeah. Okay, what a wonderful place for us to end. Have a wonderful day, go Irish. <laughs>